but there will be no pity for young men. Yeah, we're talking about virgins, you see, there's a virgin problem, virgin Mary, virgin birth, or maidens. I don't think it's virgins like petrol virgins or festival virgins, just the way they spoke about women who weren't supposed to be copulating with every Tom, Dick, and Harry anyway. The maidens or, you know, young women who have not known family life yet. Yeah. I heard something about that, that it's a mistranslation, that it actually means young, and it's been translated oh, yeah. to how to Of course, of course, because that's how it's been picked up in the Western world through Greco-Roman uh, cultural uh, influences, because it's the Romans who had festal virgins and things like that. You know, they had all this weird ideology that was centering around virginity, which in Palestine was never uh, a very big uh, uh, issue or interest. So it isn't that uh, they just assume people were that cohabited. It doesn't mean that, oh, we're going to take a microscope and look at someone and see if they're a virgin or not. But that's been, you know, we, we know the one, a virgin can see a young man, a young lady, a, a one who hadn't previously known men to an extent. In any case, it's not used in this absolute sense of the way we see it. Anyway, young women, children, so on, or young women who have not known marriage, women who have, kill and exterminate them all. But don't touch anyone whom you've marked. Uh, so you see, my anger is so great. So they don't blame Nebuchadnezzar or the UN or Yasser Arafat or whoever's trying to destroy them at any given time. It's God doing this to the moment, which is a, a really a, a moving concept, but it's a dangerous one, as, as you see. Because the guilt is, is, is boundless and the country's full of bloodshed and the uh, uh, the Lord has abandoned the country, and I, I'm not going to have any pity, but you're going to see he's going to change gears at the end of this to just the opposite. So the man in white, this is probably an angel now, with the scribe's horn, and he went around and did what he said. Now we're going to get the vision of the chariot that we saw at the beginning of this in chapter 1, right? Res resumed. It's now chapter 10, right? I looked and I saw the vault over the cherub's heads. That's in the inner sanctum of the temple. There was something that looked like a sapphire and the semblance of a throne. And whoever is talking to the man in white says, Go under the cherub, beneath the cherub, take a handful of burning coal beneath the cherub, scatter it over the city. Some miraculous sort of vision of uh, spreading this destruction. Steven Spielberg could do wonders with this. Uh, you know, portraying this with, the, or um, who's that guy that does Star Wars? What's his name? Huh? Yeah, Lucas would have a grand time with this kind of thing. If they, if they, I see Mel Gibson. He's going to be doing something about the Holocaust. Uh, that's a joke. After, uh, uh, I can imagine what he's going to be doing with that. In any case, um, these movie makers could have a great time with this sort of thing. And this spreads fire everywhere. So the cherubs were on the right in the temple, and the cloud filled the inner court, because God was in the temple, you see. And this is the presence of God, the glory of Yahweh. He and the cherubs are in the, apparently there are these cherubim, which are winged lions like in Babylon. They're not little, fat, little, um, roly-poly uh, creatures like in the medieval, you know, um, mosaic uh, ceiling paintings and things. Uh, Go under the chariot and the throne and so on. Anyway, so the glory of Yahweh rose, and the temple was filled with the cloud, and the cherub's wings were beating like thunder. And he ordered the man in white to take the fire from under the cherub, between the cherubs. They went and stopped by the wheel. One cherub stretched out his hand toward it. The fire which was between the cherubs took some, put it in the hands of the man in white, and took, uh, uh, who took it and went off. And then the cherubs had what seemed to be human hands, and I looked with the four wheels at the side of the cherubs, one wheel on each side. The wheels glittered again like chrysalides. So we're back in the earlier vision. All four looked alike. They all went four ways. Now he describes the motion. I told you that my son is very interested in this motion. He said this is obviously a terrestrial description. That's the best he could do with it. 
Their bodies, their backs, their hands, their wings, their wheels, all four were covered with eyes, and I heard the wheels, we heard that were called, remember I told you wheel is Gilgal? Here it says Galgal in mine, I don't know what yours says. We're called Galgal Circle, Gilgal, Galgal. Each cherub had four faces, and uh, we read all about that. The same one that I had seen at the River Hebar, he says in 16. So he recapitulates these things. And this is the motion that he sees. The wheels went forward beside the wheels did not swerve, the cherubs spread their wings, and so on and so forth. And the spirit of the creature was in them. What is going on here? He has a vision of God, or God and the glory of God, or God within the glory, or the presence of God, as Jewish mysticism later puts it, the Shekinah. Uh, the Kabbalists like to speak, and the religious Jews like to speak of the divine presence, the Shekinah, the indwelling. Anyway, whatever you want to call this that's in the temple that has to do with God's presence is leaving the temple. Why is he leaving the temple? Because the Babylonians are going to be destroying it very, almost immediately. So his vision here is of the God leaving the temple in the face of the destruction. And you get the chariot taking off. Paused over the chariots. Chubb spread their wings like a helicopter. The wheels rose with them. Uh, it paused on the east gate of the temple, and the glory of the God of Israel hovered over them. But this was the creature that I had seen supporting the God of Israel. It's the chariot of God, you see. Which is why that fellow, Eric von Daniken, wrote that book about flying saucers and things called Chariots of the Gods. <coughs> because this is the divine chariot. And I was now certain there were that, that these were chariots. Each had four faces, he describes them, four wings and so on. Their face were just as I had seen at Hebar. Each moved straight forward. The spirit lifted up and carried me to the east gate of the temple. Chapter 11. And um, he then goes on to describe Jerusalem again and all the bad things that are going on there. And some of the even names, some people, line 13. As I was speaking, Pilatius, son of Benaiah, dropped dead. And the prophet calls out to the Lord, so are you going to destroy everybody, God? Son of man, 14, 15, your brothers, your kinsmen, the whole house of Israel, these citizens of Jerusalem, uh, tell them like Moses, if you like, that you were sent to them. Say this, how does God address Ezekiel? Son of man. He's not the son of man. He's just son of man. A son of man. A man. Man. Uh, 